Well, let's go ahead and get started. Well, welcome everybody to the latest edition of the Power Up Cycling's webinar series. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about managing pre race anxiety. Um, and Dr. Uh, Chris Duran, who holds a doctorate degree in sports and performance psychology from the University of Western States and a master's degree in human performance from Lindenwood, um, is going to lead us through this discussion. Um, while Chris was at Lindenwood, he was an assistant coach for the cycling team and worked with a lot with a lot of those athletes. He also worked for as a consultant for the Department of Defense, where he applied his uh, performance psychology um, to groups of soldiers um, in leadership positions and command positions. He's a Cat One cyclist um, with experience racing the road, the track mountain bikes and cyclocross. So sort of a, uh, a jack of all trades, if you would. Um, anyway, we're happy to have him here tonight. So Chris, you want to Thanks, so I, don't, I don't know if I'd call myself a jack of all trades. Uh, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, I think, you know, when you talk about anxiety, it's, it's often associated with negative connotations, right? You have... Um, you know, people that say they have anxiety problems and things of that nature. And really, we just have to look at anxiety as energy. And that's where we're, you know, that fuels us and what's we're going to propels us to do what's next. And anxiety can be pretty crippling. If you've ever seen somebody have a panic attack or at their worst, at where anxiety gets the best of somebody, um, that's when it kind of really level, you know, that's, that's a whole different category than we're talking about. We're talking about performance anxiety where you you need to be able to perform at your best. And um, one of the ways that I work with athletes is I have them think back to a time where they had anxiety and where they had anxiety before race or an event or some sort of competition. And then uh, I have them think about that. So you may have something that comes to mind right away and think about the event and what happened during that event. And then go back and think about how you performed at that event and think about an event where you performed well. And often the anxiety gives us some fuel. The, you know, whether it's three weeks before or three months and we have a big event, we know that we have to take those small steps in order to get there. Um, and that in of itself gives you the fuel that we need. But really, we want to talk about the anxiety prior to the event. Let's say the hours leading up, day leading up, uh, you know, there's the three P's that we like to say is uh, puke, pee, poop. And that's kind of uh, what happens before an event, right? And uh, it sounds silly, but that's what our body does. You know, we go into this state of like, uh, sympathetic nervous system and it, we turn up real high and the, our body's getting ready to release all that excretion because, well, we're, we're going to get out and we're going to perform. Uh, that's why the porta potties are, are full. Um, but that's not a conversation that's uh, too much uh, that we want to have, but it, it's something to think about as we're going uh, through this and how we can kind of manage some of that energy in order to, perform at our best is if we're taking all that energy right away and we're not using it properly in the event let's say you're um, you know you're so hyped up revved up that you need to rev down so you're not going to be able to use that energy during the event so three things we're going to talk about today are controlling your slides legs controlling your thoughts controlling your energy and controlling your attention so we talked about the energy, the thoughts are what we need to think about prior to the event. And you can do that by, I don't know if you guys can hear that beeping, but my computer's being mad at me. But you can do that by preemptively thinking about what you need to be thinking about during the events. So the thought association, the thought performance connection is we have a thought and it's associated with feelings and emotions and a physical state. So we have a thought, uh, I'm nervous before this race, feelings and emotions, pretty simple. I'm anxiety, we get agitated, uh, we're tight, and you know that can affect our performance. 
and that's leading up to the event. So when we, we can reframe that thought and have a preemptive thought like, um, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm nervous, but I'm going to be doing the right things in the event that, we're, that we have coming up. And when we think and reframe those things, our, our mind starts to uh, find a calm and uh, be in a, in a place that's uh, better off. So that our physical state becomes a little bit less associated with that anxiety and our, can increase our performance. And uh, does anybody have a, a thought that they have prior to an event that they can think of that's uh, maybe hindered them in the past? That, uh, that didn't go as well as you planned. Let's say it's a thought that nervousness or th something like that. Anybody have anything that they can think back to that was an event? I guess I, I can go. Oh. Go ahead, Frankie. <laughs> Um, I guess I have a thought uh, before a race, uh, Gateway Cup specifically, that I'm going to crash on the third corner <laughs> at Francis Park. Mm -hmm. And what were those, you know, feelings and emotions when you had that that thought? Uh, the emotions that I'm scared and worried. And how did that make you feel, like physical state? Shaking, and, shaking. Yeah, probably not very useful. And how was that? How did it affect your performance? Oh, I'm I'm horrible. I just uh, I I'm not very confident in that race. I just mm -hmm. you know break a lot. So the thought. So, go ahead. Yeah, I just you know I don't I'm, I don't really participate. Well, I participate, but I don't really race mm -hmm. I guess in that particular race so it's not very I don't do a good job in that race yeah so that thought can really impact our performance is kind of what we're getting at and uh were you able to have a different thought that was able to um get you there to have that performance whether it's anxiety or anything like that that was more of a that it got you through there on the uh, not, productive not side maybe this year maybe this mm -hmm. season so we're hoping to kind of change that thought process it sounds like yeah yeah so really the uh the thought performance connection that can be really illustrated with some a negative thought or a productive thought uh, that gets us to where we want to go so when we talk about anxiety we're talking about those physical emotional states so we need to have planned for that thought when we know that there's going to be a corner that may or may not be challenging. We need to tell ourselves what we need to be doing. Uh, and we'll get a little bit more into that later, but the thought process behind that is that you've done it once and you can do it again. And so those are the types of thoughts where we're thinking back, back to a past experience and we're drawing upon that past experience. So you've been through that corner before, you went through the corner fast and you were successful in the corner. And those, once you start having those thoughts, then your feelings and emotions are gonna be in a more productive state. Uh, you may start to feel more confident and basing that off of the past experiences. So then your physical state will be in a much, I don't wanna say calm, but uh, more calm state. And it, you can increase your performance that way. So there was a lot there, but we kind of broke it down to using past experiences to deal with anxiety. So deal, thinking about how we performed in the past can really propel us in the future, especially when we're thinking about a corner that we've been through successfully before. Frankie, have you, did you crash in that corner before or is there a, a fear with that corner of itself? Yeah, I crashed, um, but I have done the race once since and it was fine. Like I can do that corner. I think I just worry beforehand that I can't do the corner. So, but I do have positive, I could think about good things about the corner, I suppose. Yeah, and that's like, you know, you think about the 99 times you've been through there, but the one time that was bad, and that's what we get stuck on. Uh, yeah. And we can look at 
how we can control our optimism going forward. So uh, performance is grounded in optimism. So optimism is a thinking style. You may think about people that are um, not saying, uh, you may know somebody who always has negative thoughts. You know, we often associate that person with pessimism, right? But uh, it is a thinking style. So we can, what, what I mean by that is it's a continuum and where, wherever you are in that continuum, you can move to be more optimistic just by uh, changing the way you start thinking and reframing. I'm not saying, Frankie, I'm not saying that uh, you're thinking this way because we all think that way in a bad past experience. So often when we have one bad thing, that's what we get stuck on, no matter how many good things that occurred. Uh, I like to associate this with like a performance review at work. Your boss tells you hundred good things, but we get stuck on that one thing that we need to improve. And that's that negativity bias. So the Negativity bias is what we're, uh, the tendency to pay more attention to the bad than good, simple as that. And that's what we're thinking about when we're, you know, we're going through that corner and we know we've been through that corner a hundred times, but you know, that one that we went down and we got bad road rash and uh, whatever else happened in that corner, you know, you, you break your bike or however it went down and, uh, you know, I'm thinking about past corners where I went down and uh, it's not a fun corner. Uh, I can tell you that. Uh, I'm not saying that particular one, but any corner that you crash on is a, <clears throat> that, that can be a little bit intimidating uh, to say the least. But how we can counteract and build optimism is through gratitude. So uh, gratitude is a way that, you know, we've all heard, um, think about the good things. And it's as cliche as it is, it works. And gratitude, I often have my athletes use a gratitude journal or a confidence journal. And essentially they go back and list three things that they did well on that given day. And it can be as big or as small as it, as it you please. So, uh, you know, it can be about your training ride. It can be about the race. It can be uh, something that happened at work, but thinking about those good things builds those good things up. So you, when you think about uh, something good that happened, you start to get those positive emotions that we talked about in that performance state and the performance connection. So you think about those good things and then you're propelled in the future to think about more good things because it's, you think of it like a muscle and the more we exercise it, the more good things that we think about. If I ask you one, you know, to think about three good things that happened today, I'll often do this if there's a big group of people. And uh, I'll cut the story short because we only have four people uh, here. But uh, really what happens is there, you know, you don't get too many people uh, sharing. They're like, oh, well, I can't really think about good, three good things that happened to me. But if one person is like, oh yeah, I do this every day and they start listing off all these good things that happen. They're like, hey, I went to the gym today. I went, I had a great lunch. And then I, I picked my kids up from work or whatever happened on that given day. They start rattling all these things up and everybody looks at them like, how did you do that? And they're like, oh, well, this is something I do regularly. And, that, and it really shows when you're able to do it regularly and what happens uh, and it really reflects. So. Those reflection questions that I have on the screen here, um, those are just some of the key takeaways of like how you can make that good thing happen more often. So why you reflect on those to enable the good thing uh, and occur tomorrow, because that's what we want, more good things to happen. But really it's just recognizing the good things that are already occurring and just looking at them in that way. So when you, to, to relate this back to, to anxiety and to have that control over our state, when you have thoughts of gratitude, you don't have thoughts of anxiousness. You, you can't simultaneously think about, have uh, the emotion of gratitude and uh, almost like a warm, loving feeling and anxiousness at the same time. So it's, it's, you, you can't 
go back and it's hard to go back and forth because gratitude is actually one of the emotions that we can occur and that engages our parasympathetic nervous system that rest and digest. We talked about the three P's early on. So if we're able to engage our parasympathetic nervous system and really elevate it, then we don't have that levels of anxiousness. So gratitude is a great way to calm yourself down. And they've been, um, they have, they have a tool. It's called an M wave. You can, it's, it measures your heart rate variability. You may have it on your Apple watch, or if you have a uh, whoop strap, you'll, you'll notice the heart rate, rate variability. The heart rate variability is the, the, how your heart's beating the inner beat between your heart. And when you have thoughts of gratitude, your heart rate variability actually increases. And what's that, what's that actually showing is that your parasympathetic nervous system is engaging. So that balance between our parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic being the uh, rest and digest and the sympathetic nervous system being the fight or flight. So we want them to kind of even out when we're prior to a race. Um, not to say that you want to be sleeping prior to a race, but you want to be in a, in a state that's productive for you. And that's a key thing to think about when we're moving on forward. So we talked about the confidence journal. Confidence journal, I think, is one of the, the best takeaways, if there's a takeaway here, um, is that you record one good thing that occurred during your training ride. And when you have a confidence journal and you have three months, just like a training log, you can look back at that confidence journal and look back at seeing like, oh, you know, I didn't, uh, you flip back to January 2nd and then you look at and see, oh, I had a great ride that day. And then you can base it on past experiences. So when you say, I don't know if I'm ready, I've got a race this weekend, you can pull out that confidence journal wherever you have it and say, Hey, like, no, I've got all these things. Same is true. And if you recording on training peaks, I've got a couple of athletes who I work with and they just jotted on training peaks. And just to, as a quick note, it's a, at the confidence journal, if that's something that they're working on, because it, it does really occur and they're able to think about the ride in a different way in that what they worked on uh, and their key takeaway of that ride and reflect on it because it is something that builds that confidence over time. And night before a race, when you don't feel ready, it's good to look at. So we talked about energy and we associated energy with anxiety. And we also talked about how gratitude, uh, can control our levels of energy. And we also talked about how you have to have the right energy levels for you as an individual. And individual zone of optimal functioning is, is what this chart is. So uh, on the up and down axis, we've got performance. On the left and right, we've got energy activation. So each person has their own individual zone of optim optimal functioning. I think of this as like a, a Goldilocks, is that right? The three bears, the porridge, is that, do I have my fables correct? I don't know if I do, but uh, the left would be, you know, too little. So it's the, uh, it was too cold, right? Maybe and the right. What is it, what is it? It's a little bear. Uh, it's a little bear, uh, the little, little bear is too cold, right? Not, yeah. The papa bear is too warm. Uh, I'm not going to go through this, but it's, it's too, too much. Hard. Right? It's too, too bad. Too hard. Yeah. It's, it's how soft much. the beds are. Come yeah, on, man. Soft Where'd you grow up? <laughs> I, my fables are off. You too would really? think I would have them. Uh, but it's too much, right? You're, you would think uh, you have the energy activation. You're very tense. Too little is like you're catatonic. You're sleeping. You don't want to do anything. Uh, you know, you're not, you're not really in there. So you want to be right in the middle. And each person has their own, has their own functioning. So, you know, you, you think back to the race where you performed well, typically you weren't like super calm, but you weren't super revved up. 
So it was like, you were just right. You were in the middle. It was kind of your individual zone of optimum functioning. And I see a lot of athletes and they'll say like, oh, well, they're not doing what I'm doing. And they don't take this seriously. And I hear that a lot uh, sometimes from different athletes. Of, uh, but you have to go back to this individual zone of optimal functioning and say, oh, that's what that person needs prior to a race. They need to be joking around. They need to be doing those things. But on the other hand, if, if a person didn't need to be joking around, uh, they have no business joking around. They need to be very hyper-focused and where they are in the middle. So that's where they are in the middle. Um, best I like to think about it is Usain Bolt and Michael Phelps. The, you know, Michael Phelps being laser focused, there was that image of him, you know, like just staring down and Usain Bolt is, uh, you know, he's greeting the crowd, doing all these poses, signing autographs. Both are highest level performers, but they're in that just right area. And that's a key takeaway because you, some individuals need to be rev it up and some individuals need to rev it down uh, prior to a race. Uh, nine times out of 10, if I'm working with them, it's usually they need to calm down. Uh, so it's, it's typically what we see, but, uh, and if it's, if it's a race that's not challenging, then you will need to, you know, uh, at, where it's not your A race or you've done it a hundred times, then you may, you may feel a little, um, lethargy or you, just a little bit bored with whatever is going on. But, uh, it's very rare that we see that because typically athletes are, uh, there's a little bit level of nervous energy that, that is good. So, when we think about individual zone of optimal functioning, you want that uh, optimal mind body activation. And there's three different things, the task individual. So you wanna be able to perform at your best regardless of the task, whether it's criterium, road race, time trial, or uh, us as cyclists, if it's triathlon, uh, however you're performing uh, in each discipline, but it's the conditions. So. You want to be able to perform at your best and have those energy zones of optimal functioning. You want it to have, uh, you want to be able to perform and get your energy level correct, regardless of the conditions. And whether it's raining, snowing, uh, I don't know, snow, snow might be challenging, but, uh, but it could be snow and mountain bike race. Um, I've actually, I've raced in the snow, the flurries, not, uh, not anything crazy, but, uh, but you want that, you know, when it is 35 degrees and it is raining, that's a tough, tough place to be um, and get your energy activation ready. Cause typically that's a race. It's, it's not very many athletes who are really lining up, looking forward to that. Uh, it's more of they're, they're out there. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm thinking back to a race I did collegiate that was like 35 degrees and, and raining, just absolutely terrible. Uh, but that was a tough one. Um, yeah, it was cold. That's all I'll say about that. And, uh, but, but, you know, you, for those races, you just, you don't want to do them. And, but that's the key is you have to have those energy activation levels and do what you do on a consistent level to manage that in manage those energy levels. So whether you want to do the race, whether you don't want to do the race, you have to have that performance routine and really rev your rev up or rev down where you need to be energy wise. So energy management tools, how do we, so like I said, nine times out of 10, it's decreasing that energy level. So centering breath, um, the centering breath I like to think of just one breath and you take one breath and think, let all the air out and release the muscle tension. Often we carry tension from our jawline all the way down to our pelvis. So if, as you take a deep breath, you can feel kind of all the muscle tension go away. So we carry 
all that energy in inside of us. And if you're clenching your fists and clenching your jaw prior to the start line, well, that's energy that you're not going to be able to use during the race. Or let's say during the race and you're death gripping the bars and, you know, your jaw is real tense, you know, that's probably not the person you want to be cornering right next to in a race because uh, they're more likely to, you know, have a mishap. Um, but we're thinking about it for ourselves, not for other people uh, for this. So deliberate breathing. So deliberate breathing, you think about the, there's a physical, mental, and emotional piece. The emotional piece we talked about was that gratitude. So anytime we have thoughts of gratitude um, during some type of breathing exercise, uh, the one I like to do is a simple one, box breathing, five seconds in, five seconds out. So five second inhale, two, three, four, five, that cadence, and then exhale for five seconds, doing those things. And so if you want to take a deep breath just while we're here, and I can kind of walk you through it uh, just as a simulation as we go through it. So inhale for one, two, three, four, five, and exhale for one, two, three, four, five, and repeat the same inhale exhalation. But now think about as you're breathing, you want to think about the air coming into your mouth or in through your nose and out through your nose, in through your nose, out through your mouth and feel the air coming in and out, in and out, out in and out of your nostrils. So that's the physical sensation in that piece. So as you focus in on that, you're not thinking about the outside world. You're not thinking about the race. You're thinking about the air coming in and the air coming out. And you can have a series of things, uh, whether you put your hand on your chest and you feel your, your belly expand and contrast, expand and contrast, or uh, you can think about how the oxygen is sending or the blood is sending your oxygen uh, to your peripheral uh, extremities. And we talked about the emotional piece. So anytime we're thinking about thoughts of gratitude in combination with deliberate breathing, uh, we have more calming feelings associated with uh, that parasympathetic nervous system engage us on. Great way if you um, want to fall asleep, guys, that's a great way to do it. It's just five second in, five second out if you're having trouble sleeping. And so the three by three by three, I like this exercise for um, when you're really thinking about things that, you know, that are being counterproductive and you need to recenter. And I'll show you why, because it's, you as you're doing this exercise, it's hard to think about anything else. So we're looking at three things that we see, three things that we hear. Uh, I have a typo there. So three things we see, three things we hear, and three things we feel. So as we're looking around in our environment, uh, I'll do it in my environment. You can't see it, uh, but I'll try to point out what we have here. We have a, three things I see. I see a door, I see my headphones, and I see my shirt. Three things I hear. I hear something dropping in the background. I hear uh, some wrestling in my headphones and I hear some pages dropping on, around me. And three things I feel, I feel the ground beneath my shoes. I feel the seat beneath me and I feel the notebook that I'm holding. So as I was doing that, or if you're doing it in your environment, it's very difficult to think about outside things because you're focused on the one task that's in front of you. And that's a great one if you're on the start line and you're starting to have thoughts of, that are just going all over the place and you need to be centered and in the moment, it's good to find that recentering tool. Um, maybe not on the start line your first time, doing it outside, but uh, the centering breath would be a great one to do on the start line. But if we're thinking about other things and things like that, the three by three by three, uh, great for when we need to refocus and bring um, 
bring us back to some normalcy and where we are at the present moment. So controlling attention. Uh, prior to a race, the, your thoughts might be all over the place. Uh, even during the race, they might be all over the place. And controlling your attention is key for anxiety because it's... Chris, Chris, yep. excuse me a minute. Um, your slides aren't keeping up with your uh, presentation, your discussion. It's lagging? Yeah. Which one do you see now? Oh, sorry. That's all right. I, I was looking at, I must be looking at the preview. Okay. So you guys saw that one? Okay. <laughs> Apologize. Um, let me go back. So controlling. Now you threw me off there. Well, I, I guess I threw myself. <laughs> Sorry. I've been throwing myself off this whole time is really what I've been doing. Uh, so you see, which one do you see now? That was the last slide you showed, the three by three by three. And then you started talking about controlling attention and we didn't see that one. You see the controlling attention now? Nope. Oh. Yeah, now we do. Okay. So uh, controlling your attention and controlling your attention is very associated with anxiety because you, you think about other things and think about how, where you are not, you're not really there. You're not presently focused when you think about anxiety because anxiety is often associated with the future and you're preemptively thinking about something that's going to happen in the future. And uh, it can be, really good because it can fuel us. It can give us the energy that we need and help us have a plan. But often, you know, when we're, let's say the race is in an hour, it's not really, well, we don't really need a plan. We know we're going to race. We don't need the training plan. We don't need to be thinking about how we could have trained more. We don't need to be thinking about how we could have or should have. Um, we don't need to be thinking about any of those things. So it's, it's very, key that we're in the moment and the way that I work with athletes in this is I give them the phrase what's important now and WIN because it's very it gets your attention very direct and it's associated so it's it, this can be used pre-race during the race or post-race if you, if you really but uh, what's important now is a keyword. And you can use that what's important now. And you know, maybe you're thinking about how you could have trained more or um, how hard the race is gonna be and all those things. And that's not a very productive thought in that space. So you ask yourself, what's important now? Well, what's important now is I go get my number and pin it on my jersey and bring it back and get changed and do all the pre-race routines that I need to be doing. So it gives you a plan. Uh, so it takes, it enables you to take action. And action is one of the things that uh, lessens anxiety because you're actually progressing forward rather than thinking about what needs to be done. You're not procrastinating, you're actually doing. Uh, so that what's important now is it, it identifies cues and it establishes those cues. So it's it gives you exactly what to do. And the same is true during the race. If you're thinking about other things or thinking about how hard the race is or how something happened and shouldn't have happened, let's say it breaks up the road and now you're hard on yourself or whatever, whatever reason it might be, you ask yourself, what's important now? And that's a cue that often uh, I tell athletes, uh, well, what do I do when? And they'll ask me and I said, well, you have enough race experience. You'll know what to do in that moment. And then they'll say, well, what do, how do you know? And I said, well, ask yourself what's important now. And you'll answer it yourself. And often they'll come back and they'll report back and say, hey, I, I did that. And I knew exactly what to do in that moment. Uh, so it's, you see that a lot because the athlete usually has the experience, um, a trained athlete who's raced a lot, I should say, has the experience and um, 
is able to perform at that level. Obviously, if the athlete doesn't have a lot of experience, the experience is good experience. So you can never go wrong with experience. Um, but basing it off of past experience is what typically happens. And nine times out of 10, the athlete will come back and say, hey, I asked myself, what's important now? I knew exactly what to do in the moment. I stopped having those negative thoughts. I did what I needed to do. The break was up the road. I got to the front and then uh, such and such happened. And uh, I was able to maintain or whatever happened during that race. But that's kind of the, the element of it. And I think it's a great keyword that can be used a lot and gives you, it, it, it enables you to take action at any time. So pre-race or during the race. So this was the presentation section of, of uh, what we have, but I wanted to kind of open it up to the floor to see where you guys are as far as your race experience, for as far as your race is coming up. So I think this is where a lot of people get the most value from is actually asking questions and seeing, hey, uh, you know, what do you think or how, um, what's on this topic? So do you guys have anything that you want to either share or think about or what's worked in the past that you have um, as far as dealing with anxiety? Hey, Chris, this is Jason. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Well, sorry, I'm on the trainer, so it might be a little loud. I got gotcha. you. Uh, so I'm a pretty optimistic person, but one thing that I've realized is when I go into races in particular, and let's say I'm going head to head on a sprint, Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I've realized is I have concerns around like actually going hard on a sprint because I'm afraid of maybe not being good enough and not like winning the sprint and then knowing that I like win as hard as possible. So <laughs> I've, if you've got any thoughts about how to like control your thoughts to be more positive there and kind of overcome that concern, um, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. So kind of uh, if I could recap it, you're having some negative thoughts coming into the sprint or during the sprint. Yeah, like in scenarios where um, like you're going head to head against one person and if you try hard and you lose, then obviously you feel bad. But if you try hard and you win, you feel good. And so it's how do you trick your mind to go at 100% knowing that you know the outcome could be positive but it could also be negative and the mind wants to focus on it being negative yeah and i think that's um that's hard during the race right like if you're second guessing yourself it's almost it's too late so at that moment during the race so it's um i think you know basing it off of thinking about race experience and thinking about uh how you can kind of been able to take action is just more repetitions, doing it more, and uh, and then being not afraid to lose because if you're afraid to lose, it's hard to win. And that's I don't know, Jim. You may have um, something to say here too about this, but uh, you know when I think about like the negative aspect of it and thinking about it in those things, it's it comes down to those Q words. So it's if you're thinking about the outcome during that moment and you're not thinking about the task, and I think this is where task focus comes into play, is that you have to be focused on the task and not the outcome. So thinking about the keywords that we have, you know, if you're already thinking about what's important now at that moment, it might be a little bit too late because the sprint is, you know, you're talking marginal seconds. So it's just practicing that being in that space more practicing sprinting into the wheel in front of you and then going around that person. Um, so I think building some of that past experience, thinking about those things and, um, having that, you know, I, I like to break it down to thinking about the race in three sections. Uh, when we talk about anxiety is pre, during, and post. Um, and you know, if you're having thoughts of, it's hard to have thoughts of anxiety post-race. Um, now you can be disappointed with the outcome in, the, in that regard. But, uh, you know, when I think about, are you, you have to ask yourself if you're 
um, more disappointed post race if you didn't or if you did. And uh, I think that's kind of how I think about it. But I think Jim might have a little bit of a perspective on this as well. I mean, my my thought, Chris, would be is um, if you have a plan in a particular scenario um, in regards to to what gives you the best oper- you know, the best chance of winning. Um, you know, whether it's a, you know, if we're talking about sprinting, whether it's a group sprint, whether it's a small, um, whether it's a pack sprint or whether it's a two up sprint. And if you, you know, if they, what your mind needs to be focusing on <clears throat> in the sprint is I need to execute, I need to execute the plan, the task, you know, Chris called it a task. I need to execute the, the plan. And that is my best chance of winning. Um, and, you know, and nine times, I won't say nine times out of 10, um, but I would say if, if you execute the plan um, and you still come across the line second, I don't know that you necessarily lost. You didn't necessarily finish first, but I don't know, I, I don't view that you necessarily lost. I can think of one of our um, gateway riders at Redlands in, when was it? When was the last time we raced? 2019? Yeah. He was in the breakaway in the, in the crit. And he set up and he was, and he set up the sprint perfectly. Um, and he got second. And I told him after the race, I said, there was nothing, there was nothing more you could have done to win that race than what you did. The other guy to today was just faster than you. And that's, I mean, that's, that's just what it was. I mean, on that day, the guy was faster. I mean, in other races at other times in the year, he had beat him. So you, 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 you just, I a hundred percent agree with Chris is you focus on executing the plan and then you accept the outcome. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Bull. And um, I think, you, Jim, to your point, you lose a lot more than you win. So it's, you got to be okay with losing. Um, but like you said, Chris, you lose 100% of the, uh, of, the, of the things you never try. Um, uh, Brian sent us a, a text, Chris. And he says, any particular feelings about positive affirmation type actions? Whoops, I just lost. Oh, you got it. Did I? Yeah, I exited out. You, oh, okay. Any particular feelings about positive affirmation type actions like audio or visual, re, repetitive messaging, et cetera? I assume this is a personal preference as in whatever helps you to get your optimum, optimal energy zone. Yeah, I think it's... Um you know, that individual zone of optimal function that we talked about. And uh, for sure, I like to call it the eyes off. And uh, yeah, it's can work, right? Um, I'm not too big on positive affirmations, uh, but if it is something that works for the individual, then yes, absolutely, 100% use it. Um, but uh, I think positive affirmations I'd be like, oh, just tell yourself, good job. And then, you know, that we're all good. And I think that's where we can get a little lost in the performance and positive affirmations can, uh, if, it's, if it's directed in the cr- proper way, it's productive, but uh, they can easily be counterproductive as well when we're not hard on ourselves when we need to be uh, or vice versa. So it's having that balance and seeing where we are. Uh, I like to think of uh, it as, you know, whether it's uh, a song that gets you revved up or, you know, if it's a repetitive message that, that gets you in that zone, then uh, absolutely use it. And if it, it works, do it. Anybody else? Let's see. 
I thought we only had four people because I can only see four people here. No, we, we have, have ten more. people. <laughs> I've got one. Um, I, I I raced bikes for years and years, and then I started doing triathlons. And one of the big things that I, uh, fears that I had was uh, open water swimming, especially when the water was rough. And and I would have panic attacks and panic attacks just, you know, kind of send you off into a never, never land and you, you never get out of it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, when you talk about task at hand um, with some coaching from a friend, um, I learned to, to do a few things. One was um, when I was pool swimming, I would practice missing a breath so that it wasn't unusual. And I would, I'd practice missing one, two or three breaths, um, knowing that, okay, you know, I can handle that. Um, then I would start looking at, okay, which direction is the water coming from? Uh, do I need to breathe on my left or do I need to switch over to my right? Uh, and then if it was a head on waves, which it was at world championships one year, um, there were a foot and a half to two foot um, waves that we were swimming into. And it was a matter of, okay, my head's up, I'm looking, where's that wave? If it's right in my face, I go back under and come out the other side and take a breath. And, and you end up doing that, that very short um, time frame decision-making and time passes pretty quickly when you're doing that. Uh, in that particular race, um, people that had finished uh, open water, rough water swims that I did not finish were, um, had been pulled from the, the race. And as a matter of fact, 30% of the swimmers did not finish oh. swim, uh, in that triathlon. Um, so, and, and I was like, I mean, just, just with that coaching and that near-term decision-making process, um, I was keeping my mind off of the panicking and, and focusing on the task at hand that pulled me through. Yeah, I think that's a great uh, example of just how that focus and think about the contingencies too that occur during the race and um, that really can propel you forward. I remember hearing, I don't know if this is true or not, but it sounds good. Um, Michael Phelps, his coach, would take his goggles and then throw them off to the side. And then uh, just, you know, he wouldn't have race with goggles in some college race or something. And he would have to perform without goggles, you know, something that some everybody takes for granted. But, uh, you know, when you have to, I would imagine, I'm not a, I'm not a swimmer, I've swam open water, uh, but, uh, but I'm, I'm not good. Um, but I would imagine that that's also something that occurs. Um, you get kicked, you know, your, your goggles come off, whether it's in a big race, a small race, whether it's in the pool, water gets in your eye and uh, you still have to be able to perform. So it's, I would imagine open water swim that happens. But um, yeah, that's just having those contingencies and thinking about all the possible outcomes and then having a plan and thinking about how the task at hand really can help. So that's, I, yeah, I mean, you did it excellent for open water swim. How about uh, anybody else have any questions or um, something that worked in the past that you can maybe elaborate on? So I, in the past, have a history of getting pretty worked up before races. Um, but rather than trying to suppress that sympathetic system, I kind of like embrace the fact that my pupils are dilated <laughs> and I envision them as like cameras and I'm collecting data on the people around me. You know, I'm kind of profiling that guy's head. Those four people over there on a team, there's something to look out for, things like that. So rather than just being in my head about anxiety and stress I try to use that hyperdrive that my body's in to collect data on other people yeah and that's you know um looking at it in, in terms of like seeing and 
uh, because you are in that that state where your pupils are dilated and you are hyper focused. So that, I think that's you know one way that you can kind of channel that and reframe exactly how you can perform. Anybody else? Oh. Jim, you can elaborate on this one, but I know that we had one uh, junior in the Spirits of St. Louis who um, had a physical reaction every time he started the race. And, and he was uh, pretty worked up until that physical reaction happened. And then after that, he was just fine. <laughs> and, and I think he went into those races um, with that game plan, knowing that he would be fine because he had to just get through this physical reaction. Is that one of the three P's? Yes. You remember Terry? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He would do it on the starting line or do it in the first lap or, yeah. <laughs> um, so this guy yeah. would, he would get um, really worked up and end up throwing up during the race. And and it wasn't until after that happened that he was dynamite. <laughs> he was really good. Um, but once it was kind of like once his teammates saw that he had done that, then they knew he was ready to go. <laughs> signal. Yeah. Graphic signal. <laughs> That's funny. Anybody else? Uh, I don't know. Might be able to wrap things up, Jim. Yeah. Um, if nobody else has any questions, um, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Chris. Uh, excellent talk. Um, we, um, we will be posting this on our YouTube uh, channel on Power Up's YouTube channel, along with the, the um, if you wanna know how to get, a, uh, get in touch with Chris, if you'd like to talk to him in a little more depth about this kind of stuff, um, you can go to our website and he's listed there on our website. And um, you can get, get in touch with him through there. That'd probably be the easiest thing. But anyway, um, once again, thanks everybody for attending and Chris, Thanks a lot. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you.